Well, at the time, I thought, no, lady, you know, <laughs> you're the one that's gotten liberal. The guy looks at the pastor and says, the plans have changed. <laughs> He's counting on Christ, but if it's a different Jesus, it's false. Sounds like kingdom now. Hey, absolutely. <laughs> Amen, brother. And now, the flaming sword. What's that all about? <laughs> oh, man. We had to add that to the list after last time, but you notice that I, I kind of thought I had you, and then little Paul just jumps in and he calls us both airheads. <laughs> That's right. I think I think he got it right. So we got through verse 15 of chapter 2, and so I think today we're going to try. If we make it, that's great. If we don't, that's that's fine. We're going to try to start there in 16 and go all the way through chapter 3, verse 4, probably as be as far as we get if we make it that far. And just in case anybody's wondering what you did it again, it's the book of Colossians. <laughs> I think by now they'll know it's Colossians, I hope. They better. They better know. So that's But what I didn't are. I didn't say Galatians, did I? You didn't. All right. Oh <laughs> man, you just set me up for a little apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I'm gonna get in trouble. Well, one thing about it, you guys keep proving me right. Airheads for sure. <laughs> 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 All right. Since we do got a lot to cover, no more small talk. All right. <laughs> I think we'll have a joke if you got a joke. Well, I do have a little a little joke. So there's this Sunday school class going on with uh, little kids. And I, I don't know if we have any listeners out there that have taught kids, but sometimes you have them draw things. And you want to be nice to them and say, hey, great job, but you don't always know what it is that they drew. So this teacher's talking about Adam and Eve, and he tells the kids to draw some type of little picture that illustrates a story or that will help them remember the story. And so the teacher's walking around looking at all these all these pictures, and, and then she comes to the little Bobby's chair, and she says, uh, I'm sorry, Bobby, but I can't quite tell what that is. That, is that a car? And uh, he says, yeah, it's a car. And the teacher's saying, okay, well, whatever. He's got an imagination, and there's a car, I guess, in the Garden of Eden. And she says, well... What's back there? And he says, "Oh, that's a you know, that's Adam and Eve there in the back seat, and that's God in the front seat." And the teacher says, I'm, "I'm sorry, Bobby, but I don't understand." And he said, "Well, you said that God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden." <laughs> Woo-hoo! Come on. When you here, here's the problem. When you said Adam and Eve back seat, everything in me was saying, "Stop, Joe! Stop! I don't know where you're going. Stop." <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if that reflects on me more than it does your jokes. It probably reflects on me, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, that, that's, all, that's the best one I got. It's the only one I got today. That's a good one, though. He drove him out of the garden. I yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Right. All right. So I guess if you're ready to roll, Joel. All right. And just a reminder, New King James Version, if anybody wants to follow along. But I just want to say a brief word before I get into it is that the whole rest of this chapter really is, and I put them in some different categories, we'll talk about some, but it's really everything that men and women do to try to improve on God's plan. And they did it then, and that's what a lot of Paul's letters really were, were to correct some of those things, and we tend to do the same things today. So just kind of keep that in mind as we go through here, and I'm just going to read the first couple of verses, and we'll talk about it a little bit. I'm going to read uh, verse 16. It says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. And uh, Darren, you and I have already touched a little bit here and there on the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and the idea at this time is that Paul is trying to encourage, especially these Jewish believers, he's saying, you've, you've got a sense of who Christ is, um, you're understanding that he's your savior, but you're still trying to hang on to this old system, this old religious system that had to do with these certain festivals they were supposed to celebrate, they had all these Sabbath rules and all of that, and he, he's saying that you have to let that go, and um, I think of those two verses as being what we might call today legalism, and probably a lot of people have heard that term before. Um, and how it works in in our context, in, in our modern times, is that legalism really happens when we try to impose our religious rules on everyone else. And we take those and we really put them above God's commands. And I know that could be uh, 
uh, especially when, like, when I, I became a Christian, I was so far from God at first that I, I, I mean, I had some pretty radical changes, but then I went um, and kind of set up my own little rules. And, you know, you can listen to this kind of music, but you can't listen to that kind of music. You can never see an R-rated movie or whatever it might be. And some of those boundaries that we put on ourselves can help us. But when we start telling everybody else they need to follow those same rules or they're not a Christian or they're not in God's good graces, that's where I think we get in trouble. Yeah, I, I agree, brother. I could remember when I was just a young Christian and one of the, the ladies that had some influence on me and it was up there at the park where I grew up and I said something to her and she just said, hey, this is exactly how I was. And you're all fired up, basically. And over time, you're going to see that your approach is probably not the best approach. Well, mm. at the time, I thought, no, lady, <laughs> you know, you're the one that's gotten liberal and I'm the one that's got Jesus. And now, hindsight being 2020, it's like she was right. Now, I will say you still got to be careful with that, too, because we can get too liberal. We can get too loose. You know, there's opposite extremes there. But how you approach it, how you talk to someone who you're dealing with, we talked about last time how much you learn. You know, you said I, I, it was in the podcast, you said you thought you'd have the Bible figured out in three months. Yeah. You know, and it's yeah. like, no, we don't. Yeah. And we, and we have to be careful as individual Christians and also as churches. Sometimes churches, without even meaning to, can send out the impression that somebody that maybe doesn't know as much about the Lord or they're a new believer, that, that they're not going to feel welcome there. It's almost like we expect people to be completely cleaned up first instead of, in welcoming people and allowing the Holy Spirit to do that work. So so legalism is a big one and, and I know people that, that have been hurt a lot by that and, and probably yeah. you too, Darren, but it's it's a it's a big deal for sure. Well we're gonna move into another area that I've called mysticism and, and if you're not as familiar with that we'll we'll talk about uh, at least what I'm thinking about when I say that. But let's pick it up in verse eighteen. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from which all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. And I just have to mention that I love the phrase, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. <laughs> I think it sounds cool. But yeah. here we get into a situation and and it's always good to, we want to be able to apply these things to our day, but it's also good to start with the context Paul was in. And apparently there uh, there were people there that were having some kind of experience. And, I, and I've done a little bit of study on this and, and um, don't have all the, all the details. People see things a little bit differently. But apparently there were some people that thought they had this experience. It talks about worshiping angels there, intruding into those things which he has not seen. So maybe some people that kind of went on their own personal little spiritual journey somewhere and ended up in places where, where the rest of the church you know, hadn't gone. And Paul's reminding them, hey, hang on to this body. He talks about being nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, basically staying close to, to God and that body of Christ. And so sometimes people will refer to this as mysticism, but that's basically when a person puts their own personal experience, either with the with the spirit world or angels and things like that, and they put that ahead, really just sticking to God's word and being accountable, checking in with other Christians. And I've got a just a kind of a funny story about that. I actually heard another pastor talking about this, but at the end of his service, they had some some men up front, and if people wanted to come up and pray, they could do that. And they just said, if you know, if you've got a medical condition or you just you got a situation in your life, come up and pray after the service. And one guy came up the aisle, and uh, he wasn't talking to the pastor. He was talking to one of the other guys. He was telling him that he was Jesus. And, uh, and so this other guy kind of calls the pastor over and said, uh-huh, this is uh, so-and-so, um, but he he thinks he's Jesus. You know, he didn't really know what to do with the guy. And the guy starts talking a little bit, and the pastor said, you know, I'm sorry, sir, and we'd like to, to help you, but I don't think that you're that you're Jesus. And the guy says, well, yeah, I am. Yeah, how do you know? And so the pastor is saying, well, the kind of things you're saying aren't really the kinds of things that Jesus says, and, and Jesus has this whole plan for redemption and so forth. And, and uh, the guy looks at the pastor and says, the plan. Plans have changed. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so it's that kind of thing where we we go off somewhere in our own little journey and end up somewhere, and and sometimes we we are uh, not tethered to scripture anymore or tethered to the church, and that's a bad deal. Yeah, that's a funny story, but then it's a sad story. 
you know, you hope the guy got some help and he got he got it all figured out. That's for sure. Yeah. And these days, Darren, you and I have talked about this before, just the huge impact that social media has and how you can get to information online just with literally a couple couple clicks of your mouse. And um, and some of that information is good and helpful, but not all of it. And I get kind of concerned when we're in that day and age where, where somebody can kind of create, the, I guess, the language today is their, their own brand and have their own experiences with God. And a lot of believers don't necessarily know the scriptures well, and they can follow that person. Usually those people have a dynamic or charismatic personality, and it can lead people astray. So both those things, legalism and mysticism, they, they take different forms, but they're essentially, you know, with legalism, I'm making my own rules, saying everybody else needs to follow those. With mysticism, I'm saying I'm having my own journey with God, and that's even more important than what I see in the Bible. And they're both a bad deal, Darren. Yeah, I agree. And Paul there mentions, and I think we want to talk on this, the worship of angels. And this will play into our, our purpose here with with apologetics and and how we want people to understand what's important and how we want to warn them against things that are false, which is also understanding what's important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what, what do you got on that, on the worship of angels? Yeah, well, this is really interesting, and I, I want to be sensitive about this one because I, I happen to live in a community where there are a lot of, of LDS people. Um, more people listening might know them as Mormons, but people that, that practice the Mormon religion really prefer to be known as a as LDS, and they're they're wonderful people. I think a lot of them believe that, that they're sincerely following the Lord, but their religion is based on a message that their founder, Joseph Smith, got from an angel. And there really isn't any evidence that those things that he said happened in that vision really took place, but that, there's a whole faith based on that. And it's interesting because, and it's fairly new, I mean, we're talking 1800 somewhere, and there are some other groups that you may be familiar with for those of you listening, the, the Seventh-day Adventists, um, Charles Taze Russell, who's the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, and th- those would be some of the more, I guess, popular, well-known religions, but then there are all kinds of other ones, too, that, that happened right around the same period of time and where people either were, were being visited from their from what they said from angels or they were having these, these visions and really basically built this this whole worldview or system around that that become these religions that now a lot of people are following. And the problem is that when you take those things and you compare them with scriptures, there might be some things that are similar, but at some point they, they go off in another direction and it always comes back to, to who is Jesus Christ and how are people saved. And so it's a really deceptive thing that people can fall into. Yeah, amen to that, brother. And I, I tell you, this is where it can get deceiving. You you listen to someone, for example, I saw a YouTube video of, of an elder in the Mormon or the LDS church. And if you didn't know that he was an elder in that church and just some of the things he was saying, he was even emotional about about his salvation and going to see the Lord. It's overwhelming. And you think, wow, man, is this guy, is it possible? Could he be saved? Is he saying Jesus? He's saying, I believe this. He's got yeah. these, he's shedding tears. And the thing we got to be careful about is, is none of that matters if you don't have it right. Just because someone has a good heart, just because right. someone's very loving, just because they're emotional right. and highly emotional like this guy, don't let it fool you because what matters is the facts. What matters right. is what does scripture teach? It's okay right. to have emotion. The emotion right. is great. We've talked about that in one of our other podcasts, but it better be based on the truth because right. he he says he believes in Jesus. He's crying. He's counting on Christ. But if it's a different Jesus, it's false. But if God wants to save someone and, what, and things that I don't know, that's fine. I, you know, he's God, but I'm not going to tell someone. I'm not going to encourage them in that. I'm going to say, no, they're practicing a false faith, a false belief. They need to come out of that. Absolutely. And, and another thing that, that's fairly common with these different groups that I mentioned and some others is, is first of all, though, they usually have a different idea of who Jesus is. Again, some of it will sound similar, like you said this, this with this gentleman, but at some point it, you, know, you get a, an off-ramp somewhere from who Jesus is. And the other thing is that they'll often say that Christians have missed it all, that, that for hundreds of years yeah. or maybe even thousands of years, the, the church got off track. And it's, it's one thing, and uh, we've talked about this in the podcast, there are Christians that have different views on some things. So it's one thing to say, I, I, I understand this principle to be a little bit different, but to say that the whole faith and everybody was completely wrong, and then all of a sudden, I've got it. There's a difference between false teaching and false teachers. And if, if there's somebody that's a false teacher, in other words, if I if I know that they're, if they're teaching something false and they know they're teaching something false, 
then we're actually asked as Christians, I think, to be very direct and, and go to them and rebuke them for that. But many people in these faiths, they're following a false teaching, but they may not even know it. And that's where we need to be be careful. Like in my community, if somebody in the LDS faith, if they ask me questions about it, I would try to keep going back to, well, you know, Mormon teaching or LDS teaching says this, and this is different than the scripture. And like you said, there might be people that are sincere believers in Christ that are in that, but then we need to to try to get them away from that and say that your your teaching is actually going to take you away from that Lord that you're wanting to believe in. But focus on that that teaching and not those not those individual people, not to assume that they're purposely being deceiving unless we know that for a yeah. fact. So that's good. All right, brother, shall we move on? Yes. Now this is a word that's really big for both Darren and I and and little apologist asceticism. Asceticism. Maybe tell him what it means. Severe self-discipline, self-denial. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> so asceticism really picks up in verse 20 here. So let, let me pick it up. Verse 20, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish, according to the commandments and doctrines of of man. These things indeed have the appearance of self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. And and here we see the idea of kind of extreme self-denial. And we know as Christians, uh, there is a sense in which we need to deny ourselves. We need to put others ahead of ourselves. But these are things, again, that, that Christ has, has not asked people to do. And in a more modern context, we, we might think of, of monks. And especially in the medieval times, I mean, they would literally um, hurt themselves and injure themselves and, and, and put themselves in the sacrifice their health and all kinds of things of saying, well, I'm just, you know, I'm more godly. I'm more, I'm more pious. Um, I'm not going to be part of society. I'm going to go and, you know, divorce myself from, from everything, from, from the world. And, uh, and it sounds maybe religious at first, but what it's really interesting that that last verse there, these things indeed have the appearance of self-imposed religion, false humility, and so on, but they're of no value. So the thing is, even if even if somebody can can do that successfully, or going back to mysticism, somebody who's maybe working really hard at their own personal experience with God, back to legalism, um, people that are even following that, yeah. not only, you know, not really the way to salvation. It doesn't work. I used to uh, just to use an example from my own life, and I've shared this before, but it used to have a big problem with with drugs and alcohol, and and so I'd say well, I'm going to go to the party. But I'm just going to keep my hands in my pockets. My hands weren't the problem. It was my mind and my and yeah. my flesh and my sin. And uh, so it wasn't going to matter what I was going to do. And, and uh, that's why uh, as we as we head into chapter three, um, we just need to really focus on on Christ. You know, any of these things they they can seem right. I think people sincerely will will do these things thinking it'll make them more holy, um, but it just doesn't work. Yeah, I agree. That's the when when you start thinking that way, because on the surface it looks good. Oh wow, look how holy this person is. Look what they're doing. Yeah. But the minute you do that, what are you doing? You're trying to do something in your own power. You're right. trying to be Christ then. You're trying to be your own person before God. And we know clearly that don't work. It's either through Christ or not, period. Yep. Now, see, there I am being legalistic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, no, I, I, think that's, I think that's the gospel is what that is. I, I think so, too. Well, Darren, let's go ahead and um, get through the next few verses. Why don't you read chapter 3, verses 1 to 4? All righty. I get to read something. <laughs> we're, we're moving right along, though. That, this is so good, so rich. There's just so much here. There is. All right. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And then verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. All right. Well, of course, there is where there's a big pivot point. We went through all of chapter 2, and Paul's saying, you know, don't uh, don't get into all these other things, this, this man-made religion, man-made systems, man-made philosophies, whatever they are, uh, they don't work because you're still trying to do something on your own to earn your way to God. And then he just gets to verse 3 and just hammers it. You're with Christ. You're seated with Christ. Um, your mind is, is to be on him and the things above. And what's really interesting with about this is it's all past 
tense language. You were raised where Christ is. Um, for you died, your life is hidden with Christ. And so that's a, one of the marvelous things as believers that sometimes we minimize is, and from my perspective, we're sometimes waiting for things that will help us really follow the Lord that he's already given us. In some sense, God already sees us as raised with Christ. And the other thing I would say is how intentional this is. You know, seek, set, go after Christ. Amen. Sounds like kingdom now. Hey, absolutely. <laughs> Amen, brother. And then I'll just say, when you said intentional, there's where you kind of get rid of the legalism and you just tell people, look, if you're in Christ, if you love the Lord, like you said last time, what Martin Luther said, love God, do whatever you please. That's so perfect. That's so excellent. And then that, that does away with a lot of that legalism because then that person lives under their own convictions, what they believe about Christ. You just back off and let them, yeah. you know, you're, you're not their master. And then there are times when brothers have to step in, but for the most part, that's what you do that helps avoid legalism and helps to avoid uh, running over your brother, basically. Yeah. All right, brother. Take us home. All right. Our default mode is not going to be chasing hard after the Lord, but but as we do that and we're intentional, it is amazing. And we're going to be able to experience these promises. And then as we get tempted to go into all these other ways to find God, we're going to be reminded, no, seek Christ, lean on Christ, go after Christ. And so that's helped me tremendously in my faith. And I hope it has some um, in other people's as well. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. <laughs> all right, folks. See you next time. She comes in here and she looks in the mirror. Prepares herself for the day ahead. To the well to get some water. You never know what a day will bring. You've been listening to The Flaming Sword. Until next time, remember, love the sheep. Bam. Shoot the wolves. Oh.